Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem, minimum falling path sum. We're given an n by n matrix of integers and they can be positive or negative actually, so keep that in mind. And a falling path within this matrix basically is a path starting from the first row from anywhere here. And every time we move, we go down, either directly down or down left or down right. If we can't go down right or maybe down left, then we obviously go out of bounds and we can't really make that move. And basically a falling path will be one that follows these rules and then goes maybe all the way down to the bottom row. So this is one falling path. Now we want to return the falling path sum that is minimized. So in this example, I believe it is taking one, then going down to five, and then going down left to seven. At least I think this is one way, because this gives us one plus five plus seven, which I think is 13, and that is the output here. So the first thing to notice here is that there's many different ways of getting like a falling path. And for us to create every single one of them, is going to take a lot of work like to get every single falling path starting from one we'd possibly go down to six or we can choose to go down to five or to four and then from here we make three decisions as well so from every single cell we're kind of making three decisions so trying to generalize this problem to a bigger board where maybe we have more decisions to make we can kind of think about it in terms of how can we optimize a solution like that one and what you might realize is there's a couple paths. One path would be going from one down to six and then maybe going down to eight. That's one distinct path. Another path would be starting at one, going down right to four and then going to eight. From every single position here, what we're trying to do is calculate the sum of the path itself. In other words, that's kind of like the sub problem that we're trying to solve. By the time we get down to eight, that's the question that we're trying to ask. What is the sum, the minimum path sum, starting from eight, going all the way down to the bottom of the grid? Of course, right now the grid doesn't really exist, but you can imagine that this grid would have been larger. So that's what we're trying to ask. And what we realize here is that this problem is repeated twice because we ended up getting here by taking this path and also by taking this path. So we don't want to have to repeat additional work. We don't want to have to go through that decision tree multiple times. So we can use a technique called caching. So the first time that we go down this path and find like the minimum path sum from here, then next time we need to do that going the other way, we will already have that stored within our cache data structure and we won't have to do it again. So this is the dynamic programming memoization solution to this problem. Doing it this way, we won't solve the same subproblem more than once. So the overall time and space complexity is going to be big O of N squared. Now let's code this up and then I'll show you how we can optimize this to actually make the memory uh, complexity solution big O of N or constant, depending on if we're allowed to reuse this space or not. So we know that we want to do this recursively and that we want to consider every possibility. So what I'm going to do is create a recursive uh, depth for search. You could call it something else, but it's going to be given two main parameters, the row and the column, basically the position that we're at. And before I start implementing this, I want to show you how we're actually going to use this. We actually have to call DFS on every single column in this grid. So what I'm going to do here is first just get the dimension of this matrix. It's N because we know this is a square matrix. So for column in range N, I'm going through every column in the first row and I'm going to call DFS on every column in the first row. So just like this, so zero is the row and we're going through every single column. And this will return to us, by the way, the minimum falling path sum starting from there. And we know we can potentially start at any uh, cell in the first row. That's why we're doing it this way. That's why we have to call DFS so many times. And with this, we are trying to minimize the result. So we will set the result to a big number and then just minimize it like this. Uh, setting it to the minimum 
of this function call. And then down here, we can go ahead and return the result. So this is how we're going to use this function. Now it's time for us to actually implement it. So there's a couple base cases that we're going to worry about. Well, the main one is if we go out of bounds from these coordinates. There's really a couple ways that we go out of bounds, right? Either we go row out of bounds, we go too far to the left or too far to the right, or the other one, or I think I had it backwards actually. If our row goes out of bounds, it's because we went too far down in the matrix. So basically either we go too far left or right, or we reach the end of the matrix. One of those is actually kind of a good base case. So I'm actually gonna put that here. If row is equal to N, that means we reached the end of the matrix. Like we reached the last row and now we're done with the last row. So from here, let's go ahead and return zero. The other case is, uh, and our, remember our row is never gonna be less than zero because we're going uh, from the first row from row zero and then we're working our way down. Uh, so this will never happen. But the other case, if column is less than zero or column is equal to the number of columns, then our column went out of bounds. And we basically consider this an invalid possibility. We don't consider that an actual falling path. So for us to negate this, uh, since we're trying to ultimately minimize the falling path, let's just return a really big number from here, which will kind of negate this possibility. Okay, so that's the main uh, base case stuff. The recursive case is pretty simple, to be honest. What we want to do is get the minimum of three different function calls, and that those are going to be DFS, row plus one, that is uh, calling DFS on the row below, um, and with column minus one, that could be the column to the left, and also DFS row plus one, uh, column, uh, just the column that would be below, and next DFS row plus one and column plus one. So that would be to the right. And we take the minimum of all of these. And our result, of course, though, is going to be not just the minimum of all of these. It's going to be the minimum path sum that would include the value of the current position that we're at. So matrix row column. So here, uh, oh, this should not be equal. This should be addition. And then from here, we're going to go ahead and return the result. Now, the only thing left for us to do is to add caching to this, which is pretty easy. So we can declare our cache here. I like to use a hash map or a dictionary in Python. And then from here, we will check, has this already been computed? Is this row column in the cache down here? If it is, let's go ahead and return the value that we have stored there. And otherwise, down here, before we return, Let's go ahead and throw this value in the cache. So just like this. So this is the recursive solution. Let's run it to make sure that it works. And as you can see on the left, yes, it does. So we used the recursive memoization solution. We can actually use the direct dynamic programming or tabulation solution, or uh, some people call it the bottom up solution. And we do that without any recursion. And usually we do that by declaring some additional data structure, kind of like the cache, or sometimes, like in this problem, we can actually reuse the memory that is given to us. Like it usually makes sense. Like this time, it just makes sense for us to do that because with the caching solution, we needed n squared extra space for the cache itself. This is n squared extra space, and we can actually use this to solve the problem. What I mean is when we want to like for this sub problem for this cell we want to know what's the uh, minimum path from here once we've computed it we can store that value here and so the way we were doing it before we started in the first row and then worked our way down so doing it now it might make more sense to work our way from the last row all the way up that's why this is called bottom up so if we were to do that we'd get like these values here and then from six we try to compute okay six or seven or eight which one's going to give us the minimum and then we'd uh, end up i believe getting 13 here and then from 15 we look down all of these which one gives it the minimum it's five plus seven so then we'd put a 12 here and then same thing with four look down everywhere i think the minimum we can get is 12. And then we do the same thing from here. So from 12, looking down, we can get a 14 here. From one, looking down, the smallest we can get is 13 if we take the one directly below or the one over here. And lastly here, three, 
we can either choose 12 or 12. So we'd get 15 here. So that would be solving this problem bottom up. Notice if we do it that way, basically we will have to iterate over the rows uh, from zero to here in opposite order. We'll have to go from the last row to the first row. But one thing worth knowing about this problem is calculating the falling path, like from going down to the bottom is literally the same as calculating from bottom all the way to up. So when I calculate the sub problems, I'm going to be doing it from the first row down to the last row. But other than that, this problem isn't super crazy for a dynamic programming problem, especially a multi-dimensional one. So the main improvement here is that we've kind of taken our space complexity from n squared and made it basically constant if you don't count the input memory. So now let's code this up. What I'm going to do is just iterate over the grid starting from the first row. Technically, we are skipping the zeroth row, and that's because we don't really need to fill in the zeroth row. Those sub problems are essentially already computed for us, or you can think of them as our base cases. We are going to go through every column in every row, though, so like this. And there's three main values that we're going to be looking at. We're going to be looking at the mid value, the value uh, in the row so in the matrix at row minus one the row below us at the exact same column that's the middle value the left value is going to be similar in the row below at column minus one and the value on the right is going to be in the same row except column plus one the only problem here is that in some cases this might give us an index out of bounds error same with this one there's many ways to handle it Usually you're gonna need some kind of if statement logic. And I could put that if statement like out here, make it a separate if statement, or I could put it into a ternary operator. And that's what I'm gonna do in this case. So we're only gonna assign this to left if the column is greater than zero, because if it's equal to zero, then this would normally give us an index out of bounds error. So we're gonna do that. Otherwise, we're going to set this to some kind of invalid value. In my case, I'm going to make it really, really big, float infinity. Um, here, we're going to do kind of the opposite. This only if a column is less than uh, n minus 1. Otherwise, we're going to make this really, really big. Now, after these are set, we know that all of these will be a valid value or they'll be really, really big. And remember, what we're trying to do from these is minimize them. That's why I would set them to be infinity if they were invalid. So what we're trying to do here is minimize them because what we want to know is the value that goes here in the matrix at this row column position. And we know that that's equal to the value itself plus the result of the sub problem. The result of the subproblem is going to be the minimum of these three values. So we're going to set a minimum of mid, left, and right. So this is what we put in this spot. And that's pretty much the entire solution. Now, you could keep track of the result in a separate variable if you want to, but keep in mind that the result is always going to be, depending on how you do this, it's going to be in the last row. So in my case, we kind of reversed the logic of the problem. So I'm just going to take all of the values in the last row and get the minimum from that. So in Python, that's pretty easy to do. We can take matrix at negative one. This gives us the last row. And to get the minimum value from there, we can just take this minimum of that row and then just go ahead and return that. So this is the code for the bottom up dynamic programming solution. It's more memory optimized. Let's run it to make sure that it works. And as you can see on the left, yes, it does. If you found this helpful, please like and subscribe. If you're preparing for coding interviews, check out neatcode.io. Thanks for watching and I'll see you pretty soon.